Okay, well, welcome everybody to Medicine Grand Rounds. Uh, today's um, invited speaker, or guest speaker, is Dr. Jordan Feld from the University of Toronto. I know Dr. Feld quite well. Um, when I was at the University of Toronto, we were very fortunate to be able to recruit Dr. Uh, Dr. Feld to the University of Toronto and the University Health Network. And since arriving at the University of Toronto as, a, as an investigator, as a faculty member, uh, Dr. Feld has thrived as a physician scientist. His research spans uh, the spectrum from basic laboratory studies all the way to clinical trials. And uh, I know that University of Toronto feels very fortunate to have him back on the faculty uh, there, and we're glad that he's out here uh, to speak to us today. I'll now turn the uh, podium over to our newly engaged chief resident, uh, Johnny Al Mazdi and Johnny will give a um, more complete introduction of Dr. Phil. Uh, yes, I, as we said, thank you everyone for tuning in for this week's Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. It is my privilege to introduce you to today's Grand Round speakers, Dr. Jordan Feld, an associate professor of medicine who's virtually able to be with us visiting from the University of Toronto. Dr. Feld completed medical schooling, internal medicine residency, and fellowship in GI at the University of Toronto. Following that clinical training, he completed over four years of postdoctoral training in liver diseases branch at the NIH, developing skills in both clinical and laboratory research into liver disease with a particular focus on viral hepatitis research. After completing a master's in public health at the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, he returned to Toronto, as Dr. Lyles had mentioned, uh, where he now holds the R. Phelan Chair in Translational Liver Research as a clinician scientist at the Toronto Center for Liver Disease in the Toronto General Hospital and the Sandra Rotman Center for Global Health at the University of Toronto. There he continues to lead a large clinical research team evaluating new therapeutics and diagnostics for both hepatitis B and C virus infections and has led pivotal international trials to establish new treatment paradigms. He serves on the AASLD and IDSA hepatitis C treatment guidance panel and the Pan American Health Organization Technical Advisory Group on Viral Hepatitis, and has co-chaired international congresses, including the International Symposium on Viral Hepatitis and Liver Disease, the International Viral Hepatitis Elimination Meeting, and HCV 2020. He founded and co-chairs the schwartz Reisman Liver Research Center that brings together all senior investigators doing basic and translational research in liver disease at the University of Toronto. And his primary laboratory interests focus on understanding virological adaptations to the intrahepatic antiviral immune response. Dr. Feld, thank you so much for being with us today. We wish you could be here in person, but are so grateful for your time, sharing your knowledge and passion with us. As always for the audience, we welcome questions and comments in the chat at any time, and we'll consolidate those at the end of the hour for a brief question and answer session with Dr. Feld. Dr. Feld, feel free to share your screen if you'd like, and, um, and you can go ahead and get started. Okay. Well, thank you, Johnny. Uh, you didn't listen to me and do the short, the short version of the intro, but that's okay. <laughs> Thanks for that. Uh, very nice introduction, and thank you, uh, Conrad, for the invitation. It's really um, I, I'm disappointed only that I can't be there in person. Um, as, as Conrad said, we know each other well, and uh, I would have loved to have been able to come out for a visit um, and uh, to, to be in Seattle. And also just really to, I just want to make a little shout out to Conrad. He, he not only was there for me, my, in his time in Toronto, and we were disappointed when he left. He uh, was a, a good friend and really helped uh, helped me get my uh, academic career started. So to all of those junior faculty in Seattle, we're lucky to have him. Um, and, um, and, and yeah, he's, he's fantastic. And also, it's so great to see him looking healthy after, uh, as many of you will know, he had a fairly traumatic and scary experience a number of years ago. So for me, it's sort of a relief to see him looking well and hearing that he's back skiing. Uh, and his only complaint about COVID is that he can't get up to the mountains of BC to ski, um, to ski off, off terrain. So with that, I'm going to jump into my talk. So what I'm going to talk today about is uh, curing hepatitis C infection is easy, but elimination of hepatitis so that's good. Okay. Well, sorry, folks, for the delay, but here we go. We're going to talk about hepatitis C elimination and may take a, we'll try to get through it all in uh, time. So here are my disclosures. I do do a fair bit of research, as Conrad mentioned, in some clinical trials, and I do also do some scientific consulting for companies pri pri primarily in the viral hepatitis space. 
Um, so what I'm going to talk about is, first of all, why are we even talking about hepatitis C elimination? So a little background on the burden of disease, the treatment, really how it's progressed from the old interferon days and, and, and how now that it's so easy, the concept of actually infecting people on purpose, I'll show you some data on that, and then spend the last while talking about what's required to actually get to elimination of this virus as a public health threat, um, talking about microelimination approaches, some new diagnostic approaches, and, and the, the prospect of a vaccine. So I want to start by just highlighting highlighting the contribution of these three individuals, Harvey Alter, Michael, Houghton and Charlie Rice, who I'm fortunate enough to be uh, to, to call close colleagues or friends, um, and and recognize their achievement of being that was uh, recognized with the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2020 for the discovery of hepatitis C, because it really is it's really hard to overstate their contribution. Without the discovery of this virus, uh, we would not be talking about the things that I'm gonna talk about today. None of this progress could be made. And as I'm gonna show you, this is an enormous public health burden and what they were able to achieve in a pretty um, difficult task at the time to discover the virus and then to develop the remarkable antiviral therapies we have for this uh, is really an amazing achievement. So I just wanted to highlight that before I begin. And this is really to illustrate to you how big a public health problem this is. So when we typically think of the three, sort of the big three from in terms of global public health, we usually talk about tuberculosis, HIV, and malaria. And fortunately, we've seen improvements in the treatments and outcomes related to those infections. You can see it tailing off. Um, people don't always talk about chronic viral hepatitis, but what you see is that in 2016, it surpassed uh, any of these three uh, big three. And um, uh, one of my, uh, Conrad's good friend, uh, Kevin Kane, who was his close colleague when he was in Toronto, uh, you know, he's, his, he's famous for saying, as a wise man once said, malaria makes viruses look puny, but I would just say puny virus one and two have now surpassed malaria in terms of their global public health burden. And obviously this is not a distinction we want to have, but it just highlights the need for, um, uh, for addressing this problem. And this isn't just a global public health problem that's uh, affecting people in low and middle income countries. This is a problem right here in North America. When we look in Ontario and we look at the infectious disease uh, with and look at the burden that they cause, this is the 25, uh, 25 infectious diseases ranked in order of their health burden in terms of years of life lost. And what you see is that hepatitis C actually tops this list. And if you look just fourth on the list is hepatitis B, and that surpasses things like HIV and some other things that catch headlines of course, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is not on this list yet, but uh, would, would be pretty high up for, for this year. But you might say, why does hep C or B drive this degree of health burden? And it really relates to the fact that this, these are both cancer-causing viruses. So when you look in trends over time in cancer-related mortality, you can see that almost across the board in men and women, improvements in annual mortality for these different types of cancer. And liver really stands out as an exception here along with lung cancer in women, where you see rising mortality. And this is almost exclusively related to hepatitis C and B. In coming years, it will be related to fatty liver, but these data going back a few years are all related to the explosion of uh, viral hepatitis related liver cancer. Now, fortunately, we can treat this infection. So when I started my training, we were uh, using interferon and could cure about half the people we treated with difficult to take treatment. And then over time, things got better with adding initially protease inhibitors and then better tolerated antivirals, but still with interferon. And then by 2014, the development of interferon-free direct antivirals where cure rates uh, reached um, above 95%. And I'll show you those data very quickly that like HIV with hepatitis C, we were able to target multiple steps in the viral life cycle uh, from the viral protease, the viral polymerase, and the so-called non-structural 5A uh, um, protein. And by targeting these three targets and combination, using combinations of drugs to target these, uh, we were able to cure almost everybody. And this is really no small feat when we think about HIV and the remarkable progress in controlling HIV. It's still something that can only be suppressed. And similarly, hepatitis B uh, falls into that category for the vast majority of people, whereas hepatitis C is now curable in almost everybody. So this really is the first curable chronic viral infection. And, um, and, and, I, it, and it's, it's I, I, remarkable to see how the progress has changed. So when I showed you we were curing about half the people 
people using uh, interferon for up to a year of treatment. And you can see here taking a combination of sofosbuvir and velpatosphere, so a polymerase and a non-structural 5A inhibitor. And you can see taken for just three months, and you can see this works across all six genotypes um, in people with and without cirrhosis. And I've highlighted genotype three because this is a group that was a little more hard to uh, treat, but you can see even here, even in people with cirrhosis, over 90% cured. And in the other populations, we're really probably better now at curing hepatitis C than um, most common bacterial infections like UTIs and common uh, community acquired pneumonia with a one pill a day for as little as three months. Similarly, another pangenotypic regimen, glucaprovir and pabrentosphere here, a protease with an NS5A inhibitor and taken for either 12 weeks or as you can see here down to eight weeks with cure rates uh, surpassing 95%. And this was expanded recently to include people with cirrhosis. And I've again highlighted genotype three here above 95%. So this really means that we can actually take out genotyping because these uh, treatments work across all genotypes, uh, even in people uh, with cirrhosis. And then for the few people who don't respond to a first course of treatment, we have a very good salvage regimen here. It's taking that same sofosbuvir and velpatosphere that I showed you a moment ago and adding a third drug, a protease inhibitor of oxalaprevir. Um, and if you can say that combination, sofosbuvir, velpatosphere, and voxilaprevir, you cure the patient. But it, it, for, again, for one pill a day for three months, and you can see this mops up. These are people who didn't respond to a first course of treatment, and particularly without cirrhosis, almost 100% cured, and even with cirrhosis, 93% cured. So really very good salvage regimen that's extremely well tolerated. So this is close to what I like to refer to as perfectivir, which is really uh, treatments now with 95% cure rates or better, without the need for interferon, without the need for ribavirin for as little as 8 or 12 weeks, one or a couple of pills a day, very few drug interactions, very few or no side effects, and resistance proving not to be a big issue. So really, it doesn't get much better in terms of an effective therapy. So when we have effective therapies like this, what does that actually mean? What are we doing when we cure someone of their infection? Well, looking back at some old data using interferon, when we treat people with mild liver disease, so mild fibrosis at baseline, and we achieve this sustained virological response, so the virus is no longer present three months after uh, finishing someone's treatment, you can see if you follow these people long-term, their survival is outstanding and actually matches that of an age and sex match population control. But even if you go into the more advanced population of people with cirrhosis or advanced fibrosis at baseline, what you see is that when you achieve sustained virological response, you really eliminate the risk of liver-related mortality, so almost no liver failure, a small risk of liver cancer. But remarkably, not only do you reduce liver related mortality, but you also decrease all-cause mortality. So this SVR is no longer a surrogate. It really is a relevant a clinical endpoint because of this clear association with an improvement in all-cause mortality. So why does that actually happen? Well, because hepatitis C is really a systemic um, infection, a uh, systemic disease, and it is a diabetogenic virus. So we know that people with uh, hepatitis C infection are more prone to develop diabetes. And if we cure them, we can reduce uh, insulin resistance and actually recent data showing that you can uh, reduce the incidence of new onset diabetes. And that translates to actually curing hepatitis C leading to an improvement in cardiovascular outcomes with a reduction in MI and, um, and, and stroke. So it's with these benefits that you start to see the extension beyond the liver and why our push is to not only treat those with liver disease, but to actually treat everyone with this infection. So the bottom line on this viral cure is that in those without cirrhosis, this really is a true cure with normal life expectancy. But in those with cirrhosis, although it reduces, it eliminates the risk of liver failure, it only reduces but doesn't eliminate the risk of liver cancer. So we wanna treat people before they have cirrhosis so we actually prevent this risk of cancer, which is still a major driver of mortality. It also improves liver-related and all-cause mortality and it has uh, benefits in terms of non-liver related complications. So if cure is so easy now, can we actually infect people on purpose? Well, you might say, why would we ever think of doing that? Well, 
it's not something we intended to set out to do, but I'll show you why we've been, uh, we have actually been doing this recently. So in a number of years, as many of you will know, the, the opioid epidemic has spread across North America. And uh, with that, we've seen this massive increase in opiate related overdoses. And so when you look at potential organ donors, what you see is that in 2000, about 1% of, uh, of, of, the people who were potential organ donors died of an overdose, whereas by 2016 that had increased 15-fold to 15%. And when we look at this, and this is entirely driven by the opioid epidemic and the overdose crisis, you can see that really paralleling this rise in opioid-related deaths is a rise in new hepatitis C infections. And so this translates to the fact that if you take people who died of an overdose, what you see is that the proportion who are hepatitis C infected has really skyrocketed. So you can see when you look at traumatic or medical death as the cause of an organ donor's demise, you can see that that stayed really flat over time. Whereas overdose related deaths, we see a very high proportion have hepatitis C infection. And traditionally these organs were not used for transplantation, but this is important because we were initially focused on lung transplantation, where if we just added using hep C positive organs to the population of organs that we could use, we could do up to a thousand more lung transplants in North America. And as all of you know, an organ shortage is one of the major uh, challenges with organ transplantation. In the past, because hep C positive donors were, uh, had worse outcomes with no treatment, and there were limited treatment options after transplantation, because with interferon, there was a risk of both rejection of the organ, but also very poor tolerability. Um, it was really unacceptable to patients and providers, and ultimately it wasn't done. But the disappointing thing about not using these organs is although these are tragic deaths, these are often otherwise young and healthy donors. So they have potentially very good organs. And although it's an absolute tragedy to see these overdose deaths, and I don't want to diminish that, um, there is some potential good that can come out of this if we can at least uh, use these organs for transplantation. And because as I showed you, hepatitis C treatment has evolved so quickly, the prospect of actually treating hepatitis C after transplantation has been proposed. And this first trial that was done a few years ago looked at transplanting uh, kidneys from hep C positive donors into uninfected recipients. And so they did this initial trial with just 20 patients all became viremic post-transplant. And as soon as they became viremic, they were started on this treatment, elbisphere grisoprevir, which is a, a protease and non-structural 5A inhibitor combination. It's restricted to it working in genotypes one and four, but you can see in this group, uh, they actually, all 20 people were cured. So this was very promising. Now I wanna highlight a smaller but similar trial where they used exactly the same approach in 10 patients. This study was done at Hopkins, but what they did differently was they gave the first dose of drug prior to transplantation. And the difference between these two outcomes is you see that in the first study, everyone became viremic, it was quickly suppressed and they were cured. In the, second, uh, in the second study where they gave the dose before transplantation, you can see that only three of these 10 became viremic and then they were all ultimately cured. So raising this idea that perhaps pre-transplant treatment could be extremely beneficial. This has been expanded from kidneys to heart and lung transplant in the study uh, done at uh, Mass General in, at Harvard, where they did 36 lung and eight heart transplants, again, from hep C um, nucleic acid test positive donors into uninfected recipients. And they gave them the pangenotypic sofosbuvir velpatosphere. The first dose was given a few hours post-transplant, so not pre, and then for just four weeks. So instead of the standard 12 weeks, they uh, gave treatment for only a month. And what you see is that everyone did become viremic. Um, not at super high viral levels, but they cleared very quickly. And this was across uh, all the different genotypes. And what you see here is that, uh, that they had 100% cure rate. This is showing the time to sustain virological response. And they also had 100% six month graft in patient survival. They saw shorter hospital stay in those who received, uh, in those received hep C positive uh, organs compared to the hep C negative recipients. But the one thing they did see was an increased risk of acute cellular rejection. And this finding has been replicated in other studies that perhaps getting these hep C positive donors puts you at slightly higher risk of uh, rejection. Now, notably, uh, by taking these hep C positive donors, uh, the organ, the time for waiting for transplantation uh, reduced dramatically for lung down to 22 days and heart uh, to under three months. 
So we asked the question of whether this was good, but we wondered whether we could actually prevent transmission. And we decided to use a technique that was pioneered uh, by my colleagues in, in Toronto uh, using uh, ex vivo lung perfusion, where basically the lungs are kept alive outside the body prior to transplantation in this uh, a perfusion circuit. And the purpose of this was really initially to better evaluate the function of the lungs to more accurately select good lungs for transplantation. But it does also potentially offer an opportunity to um, alter the lungs or the any other organ used in ex vivo organ perfusion prior to transplantation. And we wondered actually if putting the lungs through this from a hep C positive donor might reduce the amount of virus and actually make, make it non-transmissible. So we did this initial study where we took HCV NAT positive donors and the lungs went on ex vivo lung perfusion for six hours with sort of a dilutional effect on the virus. And these went into HCV negative recipients. And then we followed them closely after and treated them um, after two weeks uh, or uh, if they became viremic. So in our first 11 patients, this is what happened. What we saw is that virus was detected within seven days in every so ex vivo lung perfusion alone was clearly not enough. And actually, we were surprised when we treated these patients with sofosbuvir valpatosphere, and I showed you that was the treatment that led to 95 plus percent cure rates. Out of these 11 people, two relapsed. Uh, and we were quite surprised. And when we looked carefully at these folks, what we saw is that these people had very high viral loads prior to treatment. So just three weeks after their transplant, already above seven logs of virus. And this person relapsed uh, at a week 12 after, after uh, finishing a full course of therapy. And when he relapsed, he had a very high level of virus above eight logs. We actually had to dilute it to get to accurate measurements. And you can see that this, had, this was very resistant uh, virus. So multiple uh, resistance associated substitutions. Fortunately, he was retreated with that salvage regimen for 24 weeks and was cured. The second uh, person who relapsed, similarly high viral load prior to treatment and at relapse an even higher viral load. But really strikingly, in contrast to the first case, uh, this individual had a very severe uh, a relapse occurrence with what's called fibrosing cholestatic hepatitis, the worst form of acute hepatitis C, where you can, his ALT peaked above 1200 and he became quite jaundiced. Um, and fortunately, we were able to retreat him with the same salvage regimen and he was also cured. So everything worked out okay, but we definitely felt like this wasn't the best strategy. So we wondered if we could do something Thing while the virus was going through this perfusion strategy. And we had done some work with ultraviolet light in the lab and wondered if this might be helpful. So what we had done in the lab was we had exposed virus and cell culture to ultraviolet light um, and, what we, and then um, infected cells. And what you see is that you do see this reduction in the level of virus. So in the bottom graph here, you see the um, HCV RNA levels going down. But what you see that's more striking than just the level of virus is the infectivity of the virus. So you can see that by 30 minutes and by 60 minutes of uh, exposure to ultraviolet light, even though there's still very high levels of virus, this is not viable virus. So not infectious at all in cell culture using a cell culture adapted virus that's extremely infectious. So really highlighting that UV light leads to a loss of infectivity that's much greater than the decline in viral load. So if you just measure the virus level, you might actually underestimate uh, the benefit of, of UV light. So we decided then to expose the virus to ultraviolet light during that ex vivo perfusion. And what we saw is that when we did that, you can see that uh, the virus in the, when they got ex vivo lung perfusion with ultraviolet light uh, in the blue, you can see that they started out with lower virus levels, um, but what was really more striking was that they had a much slower uh, increase in, in uh, viral replication. So the doubling time was much slower um, and actually two people did not become infected. Uh, the donors in these cases had fairly low viral loads. So what we learned from these studies to date was that post-transplant treatment is safe and generally effective, but we saw these uh, couple of relapses. We learned that ex vivo lung perfusion reduces the viral load, but it's clearly not adequate to prevent infection. Adding in ultraviolet light during perfusion delays the time to viremia and slows expansion, 
but it's not enough. Still nine out of 11 became infected. So that wasn't the whole story. We also learned that there were some challenges. Sifosbivir velpatosphere has some important drug interactions which are relevant in the lung transplant setting. It's not ideal in patients with renal failure, which happens sometimes after a transplant. And then we saw these relapses, which we were surprised to see, but some of them were severe. So really highlighting that delaying treatment probably not a good idea. And that very high viral loads by the time you start treatment, likely the reason for relapse. Now we did think from that first study that preemptive treatment might be very effective. In addition to what we learned clinically from these studies, we have ongoing laboratory investigations because this is really a unique opportunity to observe infection where we're doing this intentionally. And one of the things we're focusing on is these so-called founder variants. So in the donor, you've got this very diverse, highly variable quasi-species of hepatitis C. So billions of copies of distinct, highly related viruses circulating in the donor. But then interestingly, when you look in the recipient, you see a very narrow diversity. And some of that is the stochastic random sampling of a small inoculum. But what we see is actually, even with a full organ going in, we see a much reduced diversity. So we're trying to understand what it is that characterizes these founder variants as potential guide to vaccine development. We're also looking at how the host impacts on the expansion. So you can see this was actually the same virus from a donor with where a single lung transplant was done into two different recipients. And you can see in one individual receiving this virus, they had a very rapid expansion compared to a much slower expansion in the other. So we have a number of different ongoing studies, and this is an exciting area that I hope will um, inform a lot of other uh, uh, key understandings of the early steps in HCV. But we also wondered, can we do better than what we did with UV light alone? So we thought about adding drugs and using different drugs. And there, the hepatitis C virus enters the hepatocyte using a very complex process. There are a number of entry factors that have been identified, at least five. And one of them is the so-called neiman pick c C1-like cholesterol absorption receptor, not a, a bit of a tongue twister. But the important thing about that particular receptor it, is that the um, is that it is blocked uh, by the use of azetamibe, uh, the, um, which is uh, involved in cholesterol uptake. So this is normally involved in cholesterol uptake and the way azetamibe works is it blocks this receptor to block cholesterol reuptake. And what was shown in this very nice Nature Medicine paper is that if you either silence that receptor or you use azetamibe, you can really reduce infection in cell culture and more importantly in mice with humanized livers. So this gave us an interesting idea to combine azetamibe with direct antivirals, and we decided to use glucaprovir probrenosphere, that second pangenotypic regimen I showed you, because of fewer drug interactions, safety in renal failure, and a rapid onset of, uh, action, uh, of action. And so what we did is, again, hep C nat positive donors. This time we did it across all the different organs. Um, in the lungs, they got ex vivo lung perfusion. In the other organs, they did not. They were given a first dose of azetamibe with with the direct antivirals before transplantation and then for just seven days post-transplant. This was given either PO or NG because most of them were in the intensive care unit. So this is what this is what we did. 18 donors uh, supplied organs to 30 recipients and you can see these were typically young and mostly male donors of a wide array of genotypes and you can see that our recipients uh, were, were getting a lung, heart, kidney or kidney pancreas transplants. So what happened? Well, we were very pleased to see that this strategy worked extremely well. So despite very high viral loads across all these different genotypes, what you see is that by giving this dose before transplantation and then for just seven days after, everyone uh, has virus suppressed extremely quickly. And we actually saw no virological failures in the 30 patients in our initial trial uh, who have now been followed out for a couple of years. Um, and we've now extended this, and this has been adopted as the standard of care at our site for uh, transplantation from hep C positive donors. And we haven't seen any breakthroughs. We're now out to uh, a, a little over 50 patients and a few other centers have adopted uh, this approach as well. So to just wrap up this section, organ transplantation from hep C infected donors is safe and feasible. And it does look like short course therapy for prevention may have some significant advantages over post-transplant treatment. Although I think both strategies are reasonable, the pre-treatment uh, pre uh, strategy uh, really avoids this issue of becoming viremic and also reduces the risk of things like rejection, which have been seen more commonly where most sites are doing post-transplant treatment. So that's why uh, we focused on this uh, this approach. 
But I think in any of this discussion about uh, using these organs for transplantation, we shouldn't forget that this is really happening as a consequence of the overdose crisis. We shouldn't lose sight of this. This is really a tragedy that these young, otherwise healthy people have their lives cut short uh, from opiate use uh, and overdose. And so we sh really should be focusing on preventing the overdoses first. And I want to highlight that and bring it back to hep C, because when we think about addressing and getting to elimination, we really need to address many of the things that are driving hepatitis C uh, transmission. And in, in North America, injection drug use is number one among those. So when we think about viral hepatitis elimination, the World Health Organization has set out these targets, which are quite ambitious to eliminate viral hepatitis, both B and C, as major public health threats by the year 2030. And they are calling on all countries to develop national action plans to do this. And what do they mean by a public health threat? Well, they wanna reduce new infections by 90% and mortality associated with viral hepatitis by 65%. Um, compared to uh, levels in 2015 before these were set out. So what do they mean by elimination? Well, it's important to distinguish it from eradication. Eradication means decrease global cases to zero. And the key point here is you don't need to do ongoing surveillance. We've only ever done that uh, with smallpox for humans and rinderpest for animals, but no other uh, human pathogens or animal pathogens have been eradicated from the planet. And really this is not likely possible without a vaccine. Elimination is a bit more of an, uh, 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 still ambitious, but a bit more modest goal, where you decrease regional or national prevalence below a threshold to limit its public health impact. Here, though, you definitely need to continue surveillance and control, because otherwise it just rebounds right after. So this is challenging, but potentially feasible with the right tools. But any of these endpoints, we're clearly going to need to treat a lot of people. So when we think about approaches to elimination, we like to think big and think of the global elimination, but the reality is we've got to think a little bit more locally. And the two approaches to this are either national or regional elimination, or a more commonly approach, approach to this is so-called micro-elimination. Although the big picture global elimination is the ultimate goal, it's kind of hard to get your head around. It's a little bit out of our control. Whereas these national or regional or micro elimination efforts, a bit more tangible, they're a little more achievable. And I would argue that they're politically a little more savvy because you can get behind them and make small steps along the way. So this is where our focus really needs to be. And it's important to remember that at least for hep C, when we get to this elimination mark, we're not gonna have the smallpox moment where we vaccinate the last child in Sub-Saharan Africa and prevent uh, smallpox from uh, spreading on the planet. This was an incredible triumph, but I think when we get to elimination, it's gonna be much more anticlimactic. So the advantage of these micro elimination approaches is it gives you sort of these small wins that are incremental along the way. And where might you do this? Well, you can think about it in a particular setting like a prison or a hospital. You might think about it in a population of people, co-infected people, people with a specific risk factor for infection, or a health system like the Veterans Affairs, as I'll show you in a minute. Or you might even go to a geographic, a little bit, um, but not, uh, potentially even a country, but, a, but maybe a part of a country. So let's look at the VA, which is I would dare say not usually considered to be sort of the pinnacle of, of uh, healthcare delivery in the United States, although uh, certainly there are certainly excellent aspects of it. Um, th that's not usually its reputation, but what they've done with hepatitis C is really truly remarkable. Early on, the VA actually blocked hep C treatment because it was so expensive, but it's now in some ways their pride and joy because what you see here is when you look at their trajectory over a number of years, you see this rapidly declining a number of veterans living with a hepatitis C infection. And how did they do this? They had very well coordinated leadership, so-called hepatitis innovation teams. They had very good data systems. So they were able to track progress, identify successes, and then modify what they were doing when they had failures uh, to really improve their processes in this very iterative process to lead to improvements. And they are, are really in, uh, getting towards hep C elimination, but one of the reasons that they've really focused on the success of this program is that people that were treated for hep C are also getting other care that they need. They're getting their hypertension and diabetes taken care of, um, as well as other primary healthcare benefits. So the VA is a great example of hep C microelimination. 
Some successes in prisons have been really uh, led the way in Australia. And here are some data from Spain where you can see what they did is they started screening for hepatitis C back in 2015. They were screening most people. You can see the prevalence was sky high. Almost 20% of people coming into prison were hep C antibody positive. And what you can see here, initially they weren't treating anybody. Then they slowly increased treatment rates to by 2018, they started treating everybody. And the impact of this is that you see that the RNA prevalence, so the people with active viremic infection went down from 11% in 2016 down to under 2% in 2019. And they've actually seen an associated H uh, reduction in HCV related mortality over that same time frame. So really remarkable benefits. And one of the things that they also note in this is they saw benefits outside the prison by less transmission within the community. And this isn't restricted to higher uh, high income countries. Egypt, which is the country with the highest prevalence of hepatitis C on the planet, uh, has really done a remarkable draw, a job of addressing this public health problem, despite some significant um, political instability during this period. So this is just an example where they did these test and treat models in a number of villages in the uh, Nile Delta of, uh, of southern Egypt. And what you see is they screened a huge number of people. They found a very high prevalence. This is community population-based screening, and 16% of the population was antibody positive. When you look at those, everybody, despite not having reflex testing, went on to get HCV RNA testing. Of those who were RNA positive, everyone Almost everyone started on treatment, and then as we expect with our new therapies, 98% were cured. So the overall efficacy of everyone with hepatitis C, they cured 83% of those uh, in their communities, which is really quite remarkable. Some keys to this, community involvement from every step of the way. They had free testing, linkage to care, uh, a big education campaign around prevention, and effectively multiple microelimination projects leading to really fairly macro elimination when you start to look at the numbers of people involved. But if we look on a global scale, sadly, new infections are actually still outpacing cures. So in the year 2017, when we probably treated more people than we will ever treat, there were about 1.5 million cures, a remarkable achievement. A number of people died either of hep C or with hep C. But sadly, in that same year, there were 1.6 million new hep C infections estimated to occur around the globe. So despite massive treatment uptake, we've actually seen very limited overall effect. And this is really disappointing. And it sort of highlights that as uh, Conrad was stuck here on some uh, rocks ahead, sometimes you need innovative strategies to extricate yourself from a, a difficult road ahead. And uh, fortunately, this one wasn't the time when he needed rescuing, but um, we, we, we do need to think of innovative ways to deal with uh, the, the road ahead, which can be quite uh, challenging. And really, it is coming back to this issue of the opioid ep epidemic, which is the major driver of hepatitis C in North America. We need to be thinking, I showed you the cascade of care starting from hep C diagnosis down through treatment, but we really need to shift this over and actually work upstream of the cascade where we think of all of those who are at risk of hep C and implement prevention strategies. And that really means addressing injection drug use with harm reduction, with needle syringe programs, opiate substitution therapy, and even supervised injection sites, which have been pioneered in Europe, and we've been fortunate enough to have them in Canada, which have many benefits beyond beyond hep C, of course. This prevents all of the other uh, infectious and other complications of, uh, of unsafe injection practices. And modeling shows that it's very hard to control hep C without harm reduction. So treatment alone is really not enough. It's very important, but you can't, we can't treat our way out of this. Prevention is key. That said, treatment can have a prevention preventative benefit. So we talk about treatment as prevention in the HIV world. In hep C, you could say it's really cure as prevention. And what we see is that if you can treat even a fairly modest number of people who inject drugs annually, you can have a very significant impact on reducing the overall prevalence within the community. And importantly, and people worry a lot about this, it's very cost effective, even at the high cost, and I'm not defending the cost, but even at the high cost of hep C drugs, if you treat people who are actively in, in injecting drugs, um, even when they get reinfected, uh, it, it is very cost effective. And we also know that it works. So when you look at, this is a study that we did a few years ago of treating people who were actively infecting, they had to have injected within six months to be enrolled in the study. And you can see that using this pangenotypic regimen, one pill a day for three months, 
no virological failures. We had one case of reinfection and overall 94% were cured, which is uh, I think quite remarkable and speaks to uh, the importance of addressing this uh, infection in this population. Now, does treatment actually benefit us in terms of preventing reinfection at all? Well, we've been looking at this in my lab, trying to figure out if people, if there's anything about treatment that benefits you in terms of the ability to uh, prevent getting reinfected. So what we've been looking at is people who were treated, we did so-called fine needle aspiration biopsies where we just do an FNA of the liver and get primarily immune cells out of the liver. And we did this frequently in the first few days of treatment, zero, day three and day seven, and then in follow-up. And what you see is that if you look over time, as you see that people have increasing responses to um, HCV specific. So these are looking at the intrahepatic lymphocytes and looking at how they respond to, um, to HCV peptides. And what you see is that it increases over time, but you can see it's variable. So some people had this really improved response over time and others had really no change with very poor responses with T cell exhaustion at baseline that didn't reverse. And when we looked a little more carefully, we were limited by people who were HLA A2 positive. But what you can see is that just showing two patients to illustrate the point is you see some people have this real clear reversal of exhaustion. So they have a very exhausted phenotype at baseline where you can see high expression of PD-1 and low expression of CD-127. And then you can see that over time uh, that that is changing uh, where they're getting a, more, a lower expression of PD-1, higher expression in, of a memory cell phenotype. And you see that that uh, really showing going from the exhausted phenotype down to more of a memory phenotype. Um, However, in, um, in a patient six, we see no change. So we see exhausted phenotype at baseline, exhausted phenotype almost identical at the end of follow-up. Now, what we don't understand is why is there this variability? And this is something that certainly merits more um, investigation, but one of the things that may impact it is when we treat someone. So in another study, we looked at whether we treat someone with acute infection compared to those uh, with who were, sorry, acute infection with direct antivirals compared to those who had chronic infection um, or spontaneously cleared. And here we looked at the spontaneous clearers as kind of our gold standard because these people do actually have a, a decent amount. They have partial protective immunity. So we wondered if we treated people early and we used instead of interferon, could we actually uh, get them to have a, a new response that was more similar to spontaneous clears? And this is important because it would push us to be treating people uh, with uh, an infection early in their course. And what we did see is those who were treated with acute DAs looked most like spontaneous clears, and this is uh, controlling for uh, sex, which is an important determinant of spontaneous clearance. And you can see that they had better responses than either those acutely treated with interferon or people who were in chronic, the, the state of chronic infection. All of this really is interesting, but at the end of the day, what we really want is a vaccine. And there was the first vaccine trial published for uh, evaluation of treatment of hepatitis C, and it was using something that's now familiar to all of us, a chimp adenovirus approach to a prime followed by a boost with a modified vaccinian virus uh, with uh, HCV T cell uh, epitopes, so these were non-structural proteins, uh, in people who inject drugs. This was a massive undertaking to uh, carry out this trial among a difficult population. And unfortunately, although they saw very good immunogenicity of the virus, you can see good T cell responses, and they did see actually lower peak viremia in those people who were vaccinated. In terms of the probability of chronic infection after exposure, it was identical in the two groups. So this wasn't the answer, but I think it's important to highlight this was a major uh, triumph to get this study done. And I think it, we will learn a lot for many years to come from this study uh, because it really did provide us with a huge amount of information. It also showed us that it's feasible to do this, but very challenging. So it has raised the question of how else can we evaluate vaccines? Because we can't do that kind of study for every vaccine candidate. Traditionally, chimpanzees were used, as most of you will know, for more than 10 years now, there's been a moratorium on the use of chimpanzees. And so this has raised the question of, should we consider controlled human infection or CHIM uh, to uh, evaluate vaccine candidates? Of course, lots to consider, but there was a workshop which um, 
I helped co-convene a few uh, a couple of months ago with the NIH uh, to discuss this as a possibility. And this is only something we would consider now that we have this effective treatment, but certainly many things to consider. Is this ethical? What population should we do? A huge discussion on what virus should we use? Should we take it from someone who's infected or a cell culture adapted virus? What strain? And then what endpoints do we use? Do we have to wait for people to clear up to six months, which is the natural history to know if the vaccine worked or can we treat them right away? So this might be justifiable as the only path to a vaccine, but clearly there's lots to explore uh, before we go down this pathway. And actually that model that I showed you of uh, uh, infecting people by giving them a hep C infected organ is one way where we can learn some of the key learnings from this model, but it's certainly not as not optimal given the immunosuppression of uh, transplantation. But in the meantime, we're sort of stuck with what we've got, which is we probably need to improve what we're doing. So this is in the era of direct acting antivirals. And this is the Cherokee Nation's elimination project where they're hoping to eliminate hepatitis C within their population. And you can see they've got this aggressive screening campaign, almost 100,000 people screened, uh, a reasonably high prevalence, a little over 4%. And what you see is that cascade of care doesn't look so good. Because the problem is, although we're curing most people that actually get to treatment, direct antivirals really only help at the very far end, the far right of this cascade. We really need to shift things upstream so that we're getting better at testing and finding people who are infected to get them into the cascade of care until we have a vaccine. We really need to do this better. We need to use simpler diagnostic strategies. So we, uh, especially for people who inject drugs, phlebotomy can be a major barrier. So we need to think about using these finger prick point of care tests. We can now do point of care HCV RNA using the Cepheid platform that's been also used extensively for uh, COVID testing. Um, and then we can now use some of our non-invasive tools to exclude advanced liver disease so that in theory, you could actually diagnose someone and get them on treatment within uh, two hours of, uh, of um, meeting them for the first time. This, of course, has a lot of barriers. This is the dream. It's not happening reliably. But if we're going to get to elimination, we need to do that. Because to reach people who are difficult to treat, not because they have uh, difficult medical problems, but because maybe they have trouble staying on treatment or they're hard to find. So this is people who inject drugs, people with mental health problems, people who are incarcerated, uh, women who are pregnant um, and currently cannot be treated. We know their outcomes are good if we can treat them, but we really need to simplify things. So we need to make sure that in places like addiction medicine and mental health clinics, we either make sure that people are screening or we actually teach them to treat. And we're doing some pioneering work here with um, mental health providers to actually get hospitalists and psychiatrists treating hep C, as well as some really good work seeing addiction uh, treaters uh, treating hepatitis C as well. And then we need to go where they are. So we need to go to the places where these harm reduction programs are happening and find people uh, and get them engaged in treatment, use peer support, incentives, whatever works. This is an example of a mobile van um, in San Francisco where they drive around, do street outreach, and actually treat people uh, using the van uh, with very good success. And we know now actually from nice studies done out of the NIH uh, that you don't need to be a specialist to do this. Indeed, they looked at outcomes with either ID or hepatologist providers, uh, family uh, practitioners or primary care doctors or nurse practitioners. And what you can see is the cure rate uh, was actually slightly better in the primary care providers and their appointment adherence was actually statistically significant better than with specialty clinics. So I think um, this really shows us that we've got to get out of the way. We need to, the specialists need to really recognize that this is now easy, uh, train our colleagues who were trained with just a three hour training course to treat hep C and achieve very good outcomes. Well, of course, the question is, will COVID-19 derail our efforts? Um, and there's lots of places in this cascade of care that it may affect. Um, we've seen increased drug use during with op more opiate related deaths uh, and undoubted uh, transmission of hepatitis C with the isolation and mental health challenges of COVID. We've seen reduced access to health care. We've seen people postponing follow-up care um, and not getting the surveillance that they need. I would argue the challenge, yes, derail, I hope not. It also does offer some opportunities. We can recognize that a public health approach has been recognized, at least 
some places, as being accepted as an approach to infectious disease management. We've seen remarkable coordination of responses put in place very quickly, and at least many of them have worked very well. We've seen a huge expansion of virtual telemedicine um, and telerounds, I guess, uh, which, uh, but it's perfect with simplified treatment. We rarely need to see people. Um, and then we've seen remarkable vaccine development and then roll it. So this also potentially creates testing opportunities. We've seen great testing capacity within the labs. And I'll show you that we've just started a pilot project where we're actually taking up COVID-19 vaccine, COVID vaccination as an opportunity to screen for hep C. So we know that these uh, two infections really overlapping, um, uh, disproportionately affecting some marginalized populations who often have limited interaction with the healthcare system. We are monitoring people for 20 minutes after their vaccine. So what we're doing is doing point of care hep C testing while they're in their uh, observation period, and then using dried blood spots to do HCV RNA. They don't need any phlebotomy and we can hopefully link them to care. And we've taken advantage of the fact that we used uh, a, a previously developed uh, point of care test, which normally takes about 20 minutes for it to be read. And we thought, well, you know what, this is for antibody, not for virus, and we thought, people with active infection probably have higher antigen levels and therefore higher antibody levels. So we thought they're probably gonna come become positive faster. And indeed that was true, that if you look at viremic individuals, everyone tested positive within five minutes, whereas people who had cleared the infection either spontaneously or with treatment had a variable time to antibody positivity. And you can see in a decent number of patients, and this was validated in a real world cohort, we actually saw that using this so-called five minute rule was, was uh, really had 100% sensitivity. So if they're negative, they're not viremic. They might still turn out to be hep C antibody positive, but they don't have active infection. So this reduces the number of RNA tests we have, but in a sort of high throughput setting like we're doing with this COVID vaccine, uh, this is really helpful because we can test people a lot faster and they don't want to wait around for their results. The future, this is what I hope we're going to see. We're going to have point of care, rapid diagnostics, I hope we're going to have long acting injectables as they have been developed for HIV. And then if they're as successful as they currently are, uh, maybe we don't even need to confirm cure. It really could be this easy. But to get there, we're going to need a lot of uh, support. Um, when we look at the um, NIH budget for uh, HIV in uh, so HIV is in gold, hepatitis B in purple, and hepatitis C in blue. And you can see this is the burden. This is the way, the way money is allocated. And you can see, and this is not to say HIV gets too much, it's just to highlight that viral hepatitis really doesn't get enough. And why is that? Well, it's because the HIV lobby is very strong. The hep C lobby, unfortunately, has been less vocal and less strong. And it really is because it's much more a disease of the marginalized. So when we look among people, the prevalence of people, uh, people who inject drugs, people with unstable housing, prisoners, people with mental health problems, who really tend not to be able to have as strong a voice uh, to, to drive political mobilization. But I was heartened to see President Biden step up a few years, a few days ago, um, uh, to make a proclamation on Nap National Hepatitis Testing Day. I don't know if any of you knew that that happened two days ago, but he made a $2 billion commitment. Um, and to follow up the US Preventative Services Task Force and CDC recommendation to do one time screening of all adults and all pregnant women in every pregnancy, really he stressed the importance of this and put some money and political power behind uh, elimination steps in, Can in, in the United States. I don't know if uh, we're following closely behind our, our Prime Minister um, is hasn't done as much for uh, addressing hepatitis C so far, but um, we're hopeful that we, we may follow the president's lead and put this high on the political agenda. So to summarize, uh, sorry for the whirlwind tour, but hep C treatment is now very easy. We can cure almost everybody. Um, it allows us to actually use organs from hep C positive donors for hep C negative recipients. But elimination is gonna require more than good drugs. We need improved diagnostics. We need treatment in primary care and addiction medicine. And ideally we need long acting injectables and a vaccine. Um, but political will and funding will be key to realize this ambitious goal. And with that, I'd just like to acknowledge my colleagues who have worked on this in our, our funding and take a few minutes for questions. Um, uh, I'll turn it over to you, Johnny and Connor. Yeah, um, really excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, a lot of comments about how that was a great talk. Feel free to turn on your video again now that you're not sharing your screen as okay. well. Okay, um, 
I, uh, I had one comment, which was just sort of the incredible percent uptake of testing in Egypt. And if you had any insight into how exactly in terms of implementation science, they were able to get that, because it seems like we struggle to sort of get that, as you said, sort of the cascade of care effect. And that seems to be the one where I, I see a lot of gap. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think one of the things that has actually allowed them to do it well in Egypt is that the high burden actually also creates people know about it. So most people in Egypt have had a family member, a friend, a colleague die of hepatitis C. Um, and that for sure creates sort of a buzz within the community that you should go out and get tested for this because you really might have it and you might get treated. They've and, and then they've also had remarkable political will behind this. So even with the political instability, it's amazing with this, you know, happened during some of the, the, the Arab Spring and the, the, the really political instability in Egypt. And they, they maintained their hepatitis C testing and treatment program. I have good friends and colleagues there that have led this and it's, it's a remarkable achievement. Um, but they've also really involved community. I mean, I tried to make that point, but in these villages, They've really empowered people, taught them to get engaged and want to get tested. And that's really, that, that has not happened here. That's, so it sounds like an incredible combination of tragic uh, yeah. knowledge <laughs> of the diseases sort of wreaking right. havoc in so many of families, but also just an, an incredible effort even across so many political upheavals to sort of keep that going. Um, one question that came up, uh, curious if you had any data on the, act, on, the, on the absolute rate of acute cellular rejection with the azetamibe trial. Yeah, so so we so with our trial using it with with prevention, we actually didn't see. So we the only acute cell rejection we saw was in heart transplant, uh, in and which is almost it almost occurs in every heart transplant. So it's not. Uh, we, but we did compare it to the hundred transplants done prior to the uh, to the study, and it was identical the rate. And we uh, otherwise we didn't really see. So we we didn't see that increased rate when we compared it to people who had received organs from Hep C negative donors. That being said, the numbers are obviously a bit limited to make strong conclusions, but we're pulling together data from across a number of sites now to try to, to, to really understand more clearly if early treatment actually impacts that. Because I would say, take it with a grain of salt to date with our, our trial being so, uh, small. Yeah, Jordan, uh, this is Conrad. I had one comment that you, know, you were, you talked about the CHIM uh, vaccine development sort of program. It's not so far-fetched. I mean, that's really what is done now for malaria vaccines, right? Um, there's more human malaria challenges and then uh, treatment to eradicate infection. And it's really how we do phase one and phase two uh, malaria vaccine trials now. So I don't think it's so far-fetched. I, I totally agree with you. And that's actually, I mean, Jake Liang, my previous mentor at the NIH, uh, led this effort with uh, Charlie Rice and, and Andrea Cox from Hawkins. And, and, and we, we put this together with that. But I was surprised at the pushback. And one of the arguments is that they, we, we, although we would love to have a sterilizing vaccine, most people think a vaccine is going to increase the probability of spontaneous clearance rather than be a truly sterilizing vaccine. And spontaneous clearance can happen I mean, even up to a year, but most of it happens by six months. So the concern is, do you really have to wait six months? And that was where a lot of the sticking point was, is people said, it's not, it's not okay to leave someone infected for six months. There's a small risk of severe acute hepatitis C. That's pretty low, especially we can treat them. Some people worry that the virus being there for that long could actually have epigenetic modifications within the liver and lead to cancer. I think that's not likely in someone without any fibrosis. And then people about transmission. If you've got someone who's infected for that long, could they actually spread it to someone else? I'm not so concerned again about that. I think this isn't, it's not that easy to spread. So, and, and you know that they're actually starting CHIM for other things. Uh, it's being done for dengue, which to me is a bit more nerve wracking, but also for, um, uh, for, for actually COVID-19, the UK has actually just gotten a trial approved, which again, I'm a little surprised to do it there in the setting of what we already, with the effective vaccines we already have, but. I hope we'll be able to move it forward. It's an interesting point about sort of what's unique about this in that you have to wait that six months to a year and why that may, may lead to some trepidation. Question for me, uh, reinfection in patients who had cure, uh, was that associated with a decrease in subsequent treatment cure rates? No, so that that's it's actually identical to the first round. So I mean, what what you see a slight decrease when you retreat someone who relapses, and that's because they've got resistant virus. But in someone who gets reinfected with wild type virus, and so far we have not seen a problem with circulating resistant virus within the community, uh, that the treatment response rates are identical with reinfection. 
infection. And it's one of the pushes that I always say, you know, people say, can we really retreat people? It's so expensive. But the truth is when you, someone that's been reinfected has by definition recently engaged in a high risk encounter, you treat that person and yes, for their own health, it's good. But the bigger benefit is the prevention benefit that they're almost certainly at risk of spreading it because of the high risk activities. I agree. I think the answer to that question just continues to push for treatment as cur curing as prevention mm -hmm. in those populations. Cause I, I hear a concern, you know, if you treat and then are you going to select for more resistance, but it sounds like, no, um, that doesn't actually happen. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's impossible to talk about hep C curing without talking about cost. I think you have embedded that in some ways in this presentation. And one comment that came up that I think is really important is that you mentioned holistic approach to prevention upstream of, you know, the IV drug use and, and the social circumstances in those populations, particularly house homelessness in this country. Um, it's just an immense cost, uh, but it, it, it it remains in some ways less costly than the treatment associated with hep C because of other features. So impossible to talk about this without addressing what is really challenging. And I think um, it's, it's really awesome to see the data presenting some compelling reasons to use a preventative approach, especially in our post-transplant populations, because there's such a cost associated with that treatment that unfortunately in the US, it's very hard to convince payers to pay for that upfront until we have compelling reasons that that may reduce rejection or other sort of things. And, and I'll just make the case that, I mean, I'm not defending the prices at all because yeah. the prices, I mean, when you look at the cost of, of production and you look at generic versions of these drugs, which are now primarily made in India and largely distributed through low and middle income countries, th this is now, you can a course of treatment in Pakistan for 60 bucks. Uh, 12 weeks of treatment works just the same as the however many thousands it costs in North America. So we need to bring down the prices, but the prices have come down substantially with uh, innovative pricing models. And when you look at cost effectiveness and you compare this to other interventions we do in medicine all the time, this is very cost effective treatment. Um, and, you know, I think sometimes people forget about that because of those initial sort of sticker, sticker shock uh, things that happened when the drugs first came out. Yeah, it could be less expensive, but it's it still should, worth. Could it, and should. It, it, I don't want to. But not it's still it. worth doing at the cost yeah. it is. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I we've gone a couple minutes over to make up for the technical difficulties in the beginning, but uh, thank you so much, Dr. Fell. I thought this was a really wonderful presentation. It was great to hear you speak on this topic. Um, I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their afternoon. Um, and with that, we'll conclude this week's rain rounds. Thanks again for the invitation. Of course. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks, Jordan, and I will be up in Toronto. At some point, we'll, we'll get together. Okay. Well, let me know, and I will uh, happily take you out for a beverage. <laughs> <laughs> take care. Nice to see you. Good to meet you.